Soror Barbello hails from Golden Lotus Lodge and Starve Sapphire Lodge in the Los Angeles area. She will now offer us a biographical sketch of Carl Johannes Germer, former Frater Superior of OTO, and the qualities she feels makes him a saint in EGC. May his essence be here present, potent, puissant, and paternal to perfect this podcast. Carl Johannes Germer, a.k.a. Frater Saturnus, was an occultist, publisher, concentration camp survivor, devoted disciple of Aleister Crowley, and the outer head of the order from 1947 until his death in 1962. Much isn't really known about Germer's formative years. What we do know is that he was born in Elberfeld, Germany, on January 22, 1885. He served in the German military during World War I, where he attained the rank of major, and also worked in military intelligence. He was awarded the Iron Cross, first and second class, for his military service. Germer was an educated man. He attended university, and he had a degree in mechanical engineering. Germer maintained a deep, abiding interest in the occult. He sold his house and his estate to found the publishing house Pan Sophia in the early 1920s. He met Crowley in winter 1925. In 1926, Germer and his first wife, Maria, stayed at the Abbey of Thelema in Kefalu with Crowley for a brief time, but apparently this was enough to inspire Germer to become devoted to Crowley and to Thelema for the rest of his life. After leaving Kefalu, Germer moved to the United States, where he founded another publishing house called Thelema Werlags Deschelschaft, which published Crowley's works. Eventually, Germer's visa expired. By this time, he divorced his first wife, Maria, and married Cora Eaton, a woman of means. Germer was forced to return to Germany in 1935. He was then arrested for being identified as a close associate of Crowley and for allegedly having ties to high Freemasonry. Though Germer was German, he was considered a political dissident, and these were among the first people the Nazis interred in concentration camps. Germer was detained, interrogated, and then shipped off to two different concentration camps, first to Columbia House in Berlin, and then to the Esterwegen concentration camp in western Germany. Life in Columbia and Esterwegen was brutal. Germer documented his experiences in the book Protective Prisoner No. 303, which he was never able to get published in his lifetime, but one can still find excerpts of it on the Internet. According to Germer, prisoners were starved, subjected to sleep deprivation, put in chain gangs, and made to work under adverse, filthy conditions, humiliated, beaten, and in many cases, kept in solitary confinement. This happened to Germer for four and a half months, six of which were spent indoors, confined to a small space, with no access to light, the outdoors, or fresh air. This was around the time that Germer attained knowledge and conversation with his holy guardian angel. He had memorized the holy books, and he wisely utilized this time and confinement as a source of magical retirement. One trait that Germer exhibited throughout his life was his resourcefulness. He attained knowledge and conversation with his holy guardian angel. But I believe his time in the concentration camps and his attainment came at a great cost. He suffered from frequent bouts of paranoia, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder for the rest of his life. In October 1935, and after seven months in captivity, Germer was able to escape Esterwagen. He eventually ended up in England. He managed to make his way, with the help of friends, to Dublin, Ireland, where he spent the next few years building and running a heavy farm machinery export business. He also spent the intervening years corresponding with Crowley, who recognized Germer's attainment of the grade 8 equals 3, that of Magister Templi within the grade system of the AA in the year 1938. Germer was able to stay free until 1940. When the Germans invaded Belgium, Germer was arrested again. This time he was interred into two different concentration camps on the French frontier. Cora was finally able to obtain Germer's release in February 1941, and then he and Cora eventually made their way back to the United States. Cora died in July 1942. 
Germer met and married his third wife, Sasha Andre, a wealthy music and voice teacher. During the war years, Germer was followed and spied upon by the FBI, which exacerbated his paranoia and furthered his isolation. At times, he and Sasha would pass notes to their apartment instead of speak, for fear of being bugged. And unfortunately, Germer was correct. The FBI maintained a file on, on Germer and considered him to be a Nazi supporter, when in fact, the opposite was true. The Germers continued to support Crowley for the rest of his life. Germer was named Crowley's sole representative for the OTO in the United States. By this time, the Germers resided in New York. Germer, along with Jane Wolfe, did their best to keep Crowley abreast of the happenings at Agape Lodge in California. In letters and in his will, Crowley named Germer as a successor to the OTO. I'd like to share Crowley's reasons for doing so. From an excerpt from a letter Crowley wrote to Jack Parsons on October 19, 1943, from the Red Flame Journal, number 11, Jane Wolfe, Her Life with Alistair Crowley, Part 2. You don't understand Carl in the least. You are not in a position to understand him. I was working with him and studying him intimately and intensely since 1925. It took me ten years to understand his unique greatness. He may be ineffectual and impractical in some respects. His point of view is so astoundingly different from that of almost anybody else in the world that is bound to be the case. I made him my sole representative in the United States as being the one person whom I knew intimately that I can trust but even today there are difficulties between us. In a letter received last week, he has totally misunderstood the purpose of various communications that I made to him. He thought I was urging him to take certain measures when all I was doing was to make a list of the facts in connection with publications and similar matters. I wish you could understand what it is like to be months in a concentration camp. To begin with, there is a certain amount of permanent damage to his health, from the tortures to which he was subjected, and on top of everything, he had this long internment following the collapse of Belgium and France. And even now, he is in the position of the utmost difficulty and responsibility. After he escaped from the concentration camp, he was capable of discussing the situation in Germany with absolute detachment. Of course he was, and always has been, a bitter opponent of Hitler and the Nazis, but he was able to discuss their principles, their influence upon Germany, and upon the world in general, like that of a philosopher of another country living 500 years later. If you don't understand the extraordinary greatness of such a character, I am very sorry for you. You blame me for selecting Karl. There was nobody else to choose from. Apparently, you didn't get on very well with Karl when you saw him in New York, and I can very readily understand this, although he says, no doubt most sincerely, that he and his wife laid themselves out to be particularly nice to you. But in this respect, Carl is extraordinarily difficult. After all these years, I don't in the least know quite how to take him. If I suggest sitting down to a game of chess, he is quite likely to feel himself ill-used. His thought is so pure, so concentrated, so unified, that he is liable to regard almost any remark as a malicious interference. You have to make allowance for this. Of course, at other times, he is quite normal, good fellow, but you never know. This, however, is merely technical question. The first point in any man is his integrity, and I have never known any human being in the same street as he is in this respect. After Crowley died, Germer worked in getting Crowley's works published. Magic Without Tears, 777, The Vision and the Voice, The Book of Lies. He was named the executor of Crowley's estate and custodian of Crowley's vast library. Germer did not actively encourage or pursue OTO growth as his tenure as OHO of the OTO. He did, however, work tirelessly to get Crowley's works disseminated and into print. He also spent time keeping up correspondence and advising various AA and OTO members, Jane Wolfe, Marcella Moda, and Phyllis Seckler, a.k.a. Sorrel Merrill the last of whom he recognized and affirmed her attainment of the grade of Adeptus Minor, 5 equals 6, within the grade system of the AA. He expelled Kenneth Grant from the order after he found out Grant had absconded with Crowley's initiatory writings and rituals. Germer was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 1962. 
He died on October 25, 1962, in West Point, California, from complications from a botched surgery and in great pain, alone, except for his wife, Sasha, and with almost no medical attention. There are several reasons why Carl Johannes Germer, a.k.a. Frater Saturnus, is a Gnostic saint. Number one, Germer was instrumental in spreading the logos of the new aeon that was, I believe, in accordance with his true will. He went to great lengths to secure funds to do so, blowing through two of his wife's fortunes, to make sure that Crowley's writings were disseminated in different languages and to as wide an audience as possible. We as OTO members and Thelemites have Germer to thank for ensuring the continuation of Crowley's holy writings and literary legacy. Number two, Germer attained knowledge in conversation with his holy guardian angel. He endured the horror of the concentration camps and achieved knowledge in conversation under the most incredible and impossible conditions as compared to others like Jane Wolfe or Frater Akkad. None of Crowley's other disciples achieved their attainment under the constant threat of violence and death. Germer was loyal to the prophet. He acted loyally and in deference to Crowley as his representative and in accordance with what he believed Crowley's wishes were for many years, in fact, for the entirety of Germer's life. Number four. When it came to the great work, Germer made the hard choices. Crowley knew Germer was capable of this. Other potential successors... Jack Parsons, Grady McMurtry, who was named OHO by Crowley, but he had not attained the wisdom or maturity to run the OTO at that time. Crowley trusted Germer for his experience, resourcefulness, endurance, and for his loyalty. Number five, I believe in the cases of hard choices, Germer was following his true will when it came to letting the OTO go dormant as his tenure as OHO. This was, of course, influenced by the rise and fall of Agape Lodge, which has been documented in Martin P. Starr's The Unknown God and in the Red Flame Journals No. 11 and 12, the two-part Jane Wolfe biography. He was also by nature not a people person, even though he did keep up correspondence and advice to occasional AA students and aspirants until his death. He wasn't the man to head the OTO in the way that Grady did, and he knew it. But he was Crowley's choice, and he was the right choice. Number six, if one were to describe Germer's tenure, it could be alluded to as the rule of a grand vizier or regent. He held the position, as Crowley defined it, under special circumstances, and his stewardship and preservation of Crowley's writings became the balance point against the fall-off in OTO membership. Carl Johannes Germer, a.k.a. Frater Saturnus, poured all that he was down to the last drop, into the Thelemic current, and into the cup of Babylon, our holy mother. He is truly a Gnostic saint. Thank you, Soror Barbello, for that insight into Carl Germer.